We'd like to thank you for joining us today. My name is Bill Baker with Firestorm. Today we're presenting a webinar in conjunction with the Tennessee Association of Independent Schools. This is part of the Crisis Coach webinar series. This is the, the fifth in the series. We're going to be discussing communicable illness. We'd like to invite you to become our Facebook friend at Firestorm Solutions. Or you can join us on Twitter, follow us on Twitter at Firestorm Soul. Yes, there is a hashtag for this session, and that hashtag is Crisis Coach. Firestorm transforms crisis into value and empowers you to manage risks and crises. Firestorm has expertise in crisis management, critical decision support, crisis communication, crisis public relations, and consequence management. Keep in mind that this presentation is not complete without the accompanying oral comments and discussions, and the work product that's provided today must be considered in conjunction with your organization's personal counsel. In addition, the information given and comments made should not be interpreted as legal advice or legal opinion. We're pleased to have the Tennessee Association of Independent Schools as the co-sponsor and underwriter of this Crisis Coach webinar series. Our topic today is communicable illness. Our presenter is Jim Satterfield, who is the president and founder of Firestorm. We invite you also to go to firestorm.com, where you can register for future webinars, or you can watch past webinars. And we're pleased that the Crisis Coach series is underwritten by the Tennessee Association of Independent Schools. Our moderator today is uh, Rich Martin. Rich is uh, tied up at the moment and should be joining us a, a little bit as the process continues on this morning. Uh, the Tennessee Association of Independent Schools and Firestorm have been working together with a series of crisis coach workshops uh, for our members across uh, the state of Tennessee. We did it in Memphis in uh, Knoxville and Nashville, and uh, we're planning another session this coming uh, fall uh, for a larger conference uh, on crisis management. The Tennessee Association uh, supports the independent schools across the state, and if you uh, are not yet a member, I would encourage you to go and look at the benefits of membership there and working together. And for those of you that are members, uh, this webinar series is part of that member benefit that's been associated with it. My name is Jim Satterfield. I'm the president and founder of Firestorm and uh, glad to be with you again today as we look at uh, communicable illness and the topics that are there. As we've done in all of the webinar series, we talk about uh, what's been going on in the news and updates that would be important for us to know. Uh, workplace violence remains a, a topic of great discussion uh, both in schools and in the workplace. Uh, just a little over a week ago, we had the events in Minnesota where a young man had uh, developed uh, pipe bombs and explosives and uh, had collected rifles and weapons with the idea that he was going to create a fire to distract first responders, then go and uh, set the bombs off at school, shoot students and teachers, and die in a blaze of glory at the hands of a policeman. Uh, fortunately, there was uh, some observations of some things going on. Uh, someone saw something and said something, which is certainly one of the areas that we stress. And as a result, the police were able to intervene, find the storage uh, warehouse where he had stored all the devices, and the event did not occur. Uh, that story we would like to repeat more and more, uh, as opposed to having to talk about where an actual shooting took place. Uh, here in the Atlanta area, we had the events last week at the FedEx location where a man brought a gun, an employee brought a gun to, to the location, shot several people, ended up committing suicide in, with the police response. One of the disturbing facts associated about this was that uh, several people thought it was a joke and some of the things that he had said earlier, and it's never a joke. If there are threats within your school and you become aware, that's where behavioral threat assessments for some school very, very critical to monitor and manage that process. Uh, additionally, communicable illness, which is the topic today, is a concern. BioRadar has spoke, uh, forecast that the swine flu will return in the fall at pandemic levels. So this summer is the time to pull out your pandemic program 
take a look at that, look at the supplies that you need to have in place because this will be a factor for you in the fall as the students return to school and that's really the purpose of our webinar today to talk about. One other thing to be monitoring on your radar screen is the MERS outbreak. Uh, this is a, a virus that's coming to us out of the Middle East. There have been two cases so far in the U.S. Uh, one with a flight that came in through the Chicago area and then followed the individual to their home in Indianapolis. And the other came into Boston on a plane, transferred planes, flew into Atlanta, changed planes, and then flew into Orlando. Right now, the Centers for Disease Control are trying to locate some 500 people that could have come into contact with the individual on the flight. They've taken uh, precautions with the uh, health workers when he first came in, sent 20 of them at home. The reason to tell that story is to say that's more than likely how we'll see an event expand and it also gives you the idea that now the uh, two cases have involved well over a thousand people in research and trying to address the symptoms associated with it and treat it. The disturbing concern is that one out of three people who get MERS will die. There is not a vaccination for that particular area. Certainly not a pandemic, certainly not at those levels, but it shows the, the severity that these events can bring today. So we're going to been, we've been talking in this webinar series around simplifying preparedness and the threats that are behind our young people that, we're for, that we want to make sure that we plan for. And clearly, communicable illness is one of those. The, hopefully the picture that we have up on the screen wasn't out of your school. Uh, and we had a little bit better preparation than just gargling once a day. Uh, Bill, I think this one is before my time when looking at the shoes that the uh, children are wearing in this period of time. And I certainly don't think that's an interactive high-tech blackboard that I'm looking at. But when you look at the symptoms that are coming out, fever, cough, sore throat, vomiting, diarrhea, chills, fatigue, body aches, those are the concerns that we have when we think about communicable illness. It's not necessarily uh, just an involvement with one of the major concerns and any of these things could spread very quickly through our schools. When we think about a pandemic, there are three things required to, for that to happen. First, there has to be a highly virulent organism. We clearly have that with the swine flu and we've got that with the mirrors that's moving through. A lack of human immunity, both of uh, those two events come from that area. And then the key turning point is when it's easily transmitted human to human. That tips it over, and a pandemic means that the illness is across multiple countries. So there are many illnesses that are around the world today that don't respond to antibiotics. Uh, we even see a resurgence of smallpox in areas. We've seen a resurgence of tuberculosis, and the strains are not responding to the normal vaccination areas. This is a material threat that faces us in our schools today. The modes of transmission vary. It could be a direct contact where you touch something. It could be indirect, touching something like money. It could be a droplet from a sneeze on a surface, or it could even be in the air. All of these represent modes of transmission, and that's why having a program with cleaning, social distancing becomes so important. Now, the course of an infection starts out with a susceptibility uh, to the pandemic and it'll be universal. The incubation period is from one to three days, and a sick person will start to transmit a day before any symptoms develop. So that's one of the reasons why this spreads so quickly, because it, you're contagious before anyone knows. On average, at least one, uh, two people will be infected for each six person that, to, that is found. Now, I've just told, shared with you about the MERS flight from Boston through Atlanta on to uh, Orlando, they're researching some uh, 500 people and now many more than the two have become ill and already are being treated as a result of that. You also have the viral shedding and the greatest risk of transmission will be in the first two days of the illness. And remember, you're, you can spread this even a day before the symptoms occur. As an influenza, the pandemic would last for 18 to 24 months, and there would be two to three ways. What that means is we'll have a surge through. It will come back and fall back down. 
there'll be a second reoccurrence, and then a third reoccurrence. Now, these three waves are probably about six months apart uh, on average as that process goes through. And it is possible that the second and third waves could even be greater than the first as it would occur. So who's at risk? We're not going to go through every single category, but I wanted to bring to your attention the gold text right in the center. Persons between the ages of six months and 24 years of age are highly at risk associated with it. And most vulnerable, according to the CDC, children, young adults, pregnant women, people with chronic health conditions like asthma, diabetes, heart disease, neurological problems, and immune suppression issues. So when we talk about a pandemic, we talk about these types of things, that's what we're concerned about. Now the story that we shared about MERS we're seeing uh, repeated from the SARS introduction, which occurred uh, over a decade ago, and it was a flight from Hong Kong to Beijing. There was a man who was sick, and this shows where he was seated on the plane, and he proceeded to then infect 18 people on the flight, and you should see their seats coming up and let, giving you an idea where they were. You'll also notice that at least two were infected on it. So it was not one person infecting two. In this situation, it's one person impacting 18. Out of those 18 people, four died from SARS. But when this plane landed, people got off, and if it was a business contact, they shook hands. When they got off, if it was a family member they were seeing, there was an embrace or a kiss. This is how one person can start an event and have it escalate very rapidly. By the way, in Hong Kong, this was transmitted via the elevator buttons in the high-rise buildings. People would cough, push the button, and the germ would be there and be passed on to another. When we think about historical pandemics, the standard that everyone refers to is the Spanish flu back in World War I. Uh, look at the number of deaths. Uh, look at uh, the fact that it was young and healthy adults in the 50s. Uh, we had the Asian flu, then the Hong Kong flu coming through. We've had the swine flu uh, that occurred uh, later, uh, already this century, as we look forward. Now, as this process came along, it was went across the United States in 10 days in 1918. Think about the modes of transportation then and compare them to now. Think about how much faster it will happen today than it did then. And it was transmitted by money. One of the things that they did is the study and going back, uh, that contamination and the traces on the, the paper money uh, carried to that area. So when the swine, we think about the swine flu, why is it such a, uh, a big area? Because it's easily transmitted from human to human and is a concern. We've also seen the H7N9 uh, occurring in China. It's another virus to worry about. And there are always going to be emerging threats, and MERS is an example of the most uh, recent one of those. Now, as we think about this, preparation can make a significant difference. And we've started our discussion today about simplifying preparedness, and it lets you know why this is such an important area to be focused on. But if you look at the graph in the bottom right hand, you'll see such a difference in impact if, in fact, you've been prepared to help and deal with it. And that's why we're talking about these things today. So communicable illness as it comes through and we see the various types and the transmissions. We Dengue fever is now uh, appearing here in the United States. We've got the MRSA, MRSA infections that are uh, where this they are immune to uh, the types of uh, treatments that we can give. Meningitis, the plague, tuberculosis, all of these things have occurred here in the United States. So this is not just outside the U.S. to think about. Now, it's been tracked by the CDC. There's information available in public sources that you can look at. Uh, the top one was from earlier this year where I clipped showing high levels of activity for influenza, and then a, a report around the same time uh, showing a preparedness report uh, and estimates. And you can look at concentrations of those on a state basis. And this is an example of something that I would recommend that you monitor and track as a as a free system that you don't have to worry about someone interpreting it. So when we think about critical decisions, we follow a predict, plan, perform approach. We're reviewing your policies, developing plans, training, and testing them. And the time to do all of these things are now. Let's think a little bit more about the predict phase and getting started. Now is the time when we don't have it is to get senior level buy-in in your organization. Develop 
teams to pull together, looking at how you would deal with a communicable illness or a pandemic outbreak. We use the term communicable illness because many people don't feel that there will be a pandemic and so they don't uh, focus on it. But you can tell there's a lot of things to do to start to get started on, the, on a roadmap. Coming out with checklists, looking at what the impacts will be on you financially, on the, uh, how you're going to communicate from a human resource. Are we going to pay our teachers uh, in this area if they're out sick? And will if they're afraid to come to school as a result of that, what would happen? And so if you look at all the elements that you need to start working through now, now you have the luxury of time, as we've discussed before. It becomes a, an, an issue for your board as you look at the your board of directors or your trustees uh, directing the school leadership to put plans in place because failure to plan means that the business judgment rule doesn't apply and it potentially voids coverage under the existing directors and officers insurance for the uh, organization. Monitoring and triggers, uh, we look, we're looking at three levels, guarded, elevated, and unset. And we'll talk a little bit more about those in just a few minutes. But this is one of the key aspects and a key differential that Firestorm brings as you would focus on it. Because you need to know when it is in, at high levels in your area. That's where it's going to have the most impact to your school. So one of the things you have to do is to monitor. Uh, to separate the rumors or the facts. There'll be stories and sometimes these will be incorrect and sometimes they'll be a local, uh, be more substantive in the process, but the internet certainly can provide a lot of information. Uh, there's social media and look at government authorities, local, hate, state, federal. I'll show you some more examples of that in just a moment, but even the CDC site gives you great information as these areas start to look at. Additionally, you can look at uh, media and what they're saying uh, and getting those reports. And I want you to pay particular attention as we build the information around guarded, elevated, and severe. Now, here's a shot of Florida. This came out from the state of Florida. They produce week, weekly an influenza report. The state of Tennessee does the same thing. But you would see if you're in one of those counties that was listed as red, those would be areas where you might want to start to be more aware of what's going on in your school. Now, it's not saying that you couldn't have an illness in one of the other counties, but certainly that starts to move you through this guarded, elevated, and severe area. Now, the reason we're talking about that is when the World Health Organization, that's what the letters WHO stand for, uh, used to have six pandemic phases, and they went to phase six very early in the swine flu. And uh, they were challenged by a lot of the media and others that they call people to battle stations, uh, escalating this very early, and, and individuals didn't know what to do within that process. Since that time, they backed off of it and just gone to a pre-pandemic thing. So there's an internet pandemic period, an alert phase, a pandemic phase, and then a transition back. So once it moves away from being not a pandemic, the instant that they say it is a pandemic, then from their perspective, it's up to you to figure out what to do. Now, Firestorm has analyzed this, and we call the first area a pre-action phase. That's the area for us to plan and monitor to be aware. Once we see the pandemic phase declared, we call that an imminent stage. The disease is now uh, there. It mutates. It's easily transmittable to human to human, and there are multiple human cases. This would say it's imminent. Now, imminent doesn't mean it's in your area, but it becomes much more on your radar that you need to address. Now then, we look at it as it moves across the country. Guarded is that there's a risk of impact to the company or the school, uh, critical areas, but it's not in your area. So if you're in Tennessee, where our schools are today that we're speaking with, and it's happening in New England, that's not as good. You're still in that guarded mode. Elevated means when you see it geographically proximic to your area. So maybe it's in the Carolinas, could be in Kentucky, might be down in Georgia, but still not yet in Tennessee. Now notice it's at the severe level. There's personal person cases. They're in the area where you're located. So if you're listening today in Chattanooga, if it's in Chattanooga, that's you. Or if you're in Nashville, that's you. Or Memphis or Knoxville. 
So when you see it in your town, when you see those reports, now we're at a severe stage and this will alter how we escalate and operate uh, in the process. Even after it's de-escalate, then we would then uh, start to monitor and transition back to business as usual as we go forward. So the pandemic planning, you've got to have policies and procedures in place, a cleaning policy, hygiene, social distancing, telework. Can we teach our classes? There's a new Google education program that perhaps maybe your teachers could use uh, to continue your classwork uh, in those events. There's travel policies and visitor policies, restricting it so you don't want to bring those areas together. Uh, we talked about the droplets and the transmission earlier in our webinar today. That's where the cleaning possibilities uh, come in, uh, cleaning those desks and tables and blackboards with a 5% bleach solution to uh, destroy the bacteria. Uh, you, not, uh, you need to also think about the uh, personal protective equipment. That's what the PPE at the top of the chart talks about. When the swine flu came through before, uh, there was a shortage of the mass that could protect. So stockpiling some of those things now, or the latex gloves, uh, in addition to the other supply that's associated with it. And focusing on what we're going to communicate. We don't want to create a panic, but we've got to then lead our students and our parents and our teachers in what they need to know when they need to know it. And we would start to prepare those elements uh, and with posters up in our school about what activities you need to do from a hygiene standpoint. Uh, notice the washing of hands. And, uh, and what the school is going to do. So these are the areas that you want to start educating everyone in advance to be prepared. Now it's occurred. We're moving into the train and uh, perform. We're going to have to have policies and look at how we're going to deal with absenteeism, how we're going to handle each of those areas. Uh, when we spoke about how it's going to modify bereavement, quarantines, closing, travels. Travels, imagine uh, if we've got sporting events or we have field trips that our students are taking and having to deal with those and how we're going to control it, looking at workers' compensation, Family Medical Leave Act, health insurance, retirement, pension funds, all of these areas come together. People will be looking for money at this point in time, particularly if you've had to close the school and you're not going to be able to pay the teachers. Are they looking at unemployment, separation pay, uh, accessing their 401k? What's covered by workers' compensation? You'll have some that will say, we became ill because you required me to come to work, therefore it's not my health benefits, my health plan that's covering it. I want to file a workers' compensation claim. So in understanding those areas, it becomes very involved. Other legal issues, Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, the HIPAA types of protection of information, all of these areas start to come together. You're not going to be able to say that Mary has the swine flu because you would have done, had a HIPAA violation at that point in time. So how we deal with these things have to be thought out in an orderly manner well in advance as we come through. Looking at your insurance coverage and analyzing uh, your policies, the stop loss, what's going to happen if you have to close school? Are you going to refund tuition? Uh, is there business interruption insurance to pay for that? How will all of these events be processed? and looking at your vendors. If you've got people that are coming onto your school that uh, handle the food services or the cleaning or even the security and other areas, do they have plans? And if they cease to come in, what are your strategies and how will you deal with it? As we look in the planning area, you want to think about all of these areas as we've already identified to be focusing on uh, the aspect. Social distancing may well be that we spread our desks for the report. We don't sit at tables and work in small groups anymore uh, during this area where we're in that guarded, elevated, and severe level. Uh, keeping everyone well, and whether it says employees or students, that's what we're looking at. Visitor policies, we may not let people come in that we don't know into our school so that we can minimize those aspects of it. Uh, protecting uh, to spread the infection. Uh, again, all the excellent work that you've been doing in your schools about sneezing into your elbow, uh, washing your hands. Uh, I will remind you again that the right way on washing hands is that hands should be washed with soap and water. By the way, there's not a, 
a, a differential between soap and antibacterial soap. You get the same level of cleaning with any soap at this level. But the length of time is important here, 15 to 20 seconds. Um, that's the equivalent of singing the happy birthday song a couple of times. Now, you may look a little foolish in the restroom singing happy birthday to the mirror and washing your hands, but something to indicate that it's much more than just turning the water on, putting your hands under it with no soap, taking them out, drying them off, and leaving. Those are not uh, being washed uh, at that point. Notice the sharing of drinking cups or utensils. Uh, the whole idea that we have to have a great deal of information here. Uh, we were had worked with a school that when they were concerned about this, they had uh, a higher absenteeism rate, and they picked up the phone and called their local health department. The health department notified the media, and immediately they had trucks pulling up to their location announcing an outbreak at the school. So you want to have as much information as you can prepared so that you can control this process, so that you can control the communications area, because immediately communications could suddenly be a significant issue for you. This could well trigger exposure, and you, we do not want to have our parents thinking that our school is not safe, and we really don't want our school to be unsafe. So that's why the monitoring becomes so very, very important. Thinking about looking at all of these aspects, the World Health Organization, the Centers for Disease Control, the state of Tennessee's website. Even the Federal Reserve pushes out information on it because of the impact across the area. You want to start in the, what the local news stories are focused on, tracking incidences of absenteeism, the number of people that are out. Uh, look for spikes in fraud incurring because there will be individuals trying to take advantage of these areas. And then think about other businesses and schools in your areas. Are they closing? If you're hearing bank runs where someone's running to the bank to get cash because cash will be an issue associated in this area. Uh, I live in the Atlanta area. We have three or four snowflakes. We have a run on all of the grocery stores to get milk and bread and eggs. There will also be at this point in time fuel and food shortages because people will not be able to go to the grocery store. As a result of the swine flu uh, several years ago, We've seen most of the grocery stores put hand wipes uh, for the grocery carts. Uh, the awareness level is going to go up significantly at this point in time. So you need to have a specific monitoring program in your school to be ready. Now, you want to start looking at this at each phase, whether it's the pre-pandemic, the onset, or the severity levels that you see as you look at it. You'll be monitoring different areas in each of those if you've got questions about this, we certainly will be glad to work with you to help you build a communicable illness plan. The monitoring and infection control um, shows here in what we would do in the pre-action phase as we go through each one of those areas to be ready to deal with it. And then critical vendors, looking at them in the phases to see how they're dealt with, looking at your HR and operational policies, are we going to uh, require students to uh, notify us, get a doctor's permit before they can return. And in some cases, that may become impossible. If there's a certainly a pandemic at high levels, we won't be able to have that clearance. But we certainly want people who are expressing symptoms not to come into school at this point. By the way, there will be some individuals that will be afraid to come to school. And so talking about those decisions now and building the policies in place to very important. Then what are we communicating? And communications at each level, pre, imminent, and then when we're in the guarded and escalated levels. Planning those, writing those messages out now, creating the message maps we've talked about in earlier webinars certainly becomes a key associated with this. Then you've got to test your plan. If you've written this plan, you have everything together, I think sitting down and talking with your teachers, describing what could occur, what you're going to be able to put into place so that everyone is aware of this. And at least running an exercise, uh, a tabletop exercise, showing a series of escalations and talking about what's going to be happening at each particular point along the way. And the training, having a schedule. And it's important to do the training before the event has occurred. Now, we'll want to remind people as we move on into that guarded, elevated, and severe 
to keep those levels in place to be able to be aware of what's being done. And there'll be various responsibilities for each individual department. Um, and keeping your plan organized, keeping it updated and current. Uh, we would not have mentioned MIRS to you uh, had we uh, done this webinar 90 days ago. MIRS now is on the horizon. It's a threat that's starting to uh, occur here in the United States. Uh, so you want to be aware of new information, new additions, updating your plan, and maintaining it. Those are all the elements that you need to be putting into place now in order to address with communicable illness later. Now I want to remind you of one last thing as we think about it, and it's what our, your mother told you about wash your hands. It's the biggest health changing habit that you can, can have. Uh, it's amazing the number of times that you touch your face unintendedly. But as you've touched a surface, uh, surface as you've shaken hands with someone else, uh, as people have sneezed, Washing your hands is one of the best preventative measures that we can do. And remember, this is a 15 to a 20 second um, interval as we go forward. Now, through the working with the Tennessee Association of Independent Schools, we have made available to you a chance to look at your school preparedness plan. Uh, the, there is no fee to your school to do that. That's been underwritten by the Tennessee Association for all of its members. Uh, Again, another great member benefit from the Tennessee Association. Uh, this, we look at the several dimensions that are required, and we look at specific data points in each of those dimensions as we go through them. Um, we ask the questions, have the interview, then we'll follow back up with you the week after to give you an oral report on how you did, and then send you the written report for you to study and plan. And in the written report, it'll be about 16 pages long, it will describe each dimension and then state where you have indicated that you are. It will also assign you a percentage of standards and best practices for each dimension and overall, as well as being able to benchmark your school against others. Now, there are a lot of questions about all of these areas, but now I think you see how it starts to come together. Communicable illness is one of the dimensions in school preparedness to think about. And today our goal was to give you some idea of what you want to start working on and thinking of. If you'll contact us at Firestorm and mention TAIS, the Tennessee Association of Independent Schools, you will, someone will contact you and schedule the uh, $2,500 assessment at no cost for you and no cost to your school as a result of that. Uh, you'll receive a call from uh, one of the Firestorm principals, and uh, in the case of Tennessee, most likely that's Gertie. So look for a call from Gertie, and you'll be very pleased to meet her and listen to uh, what she can share with you on this subject. We follow a predict, plan, perform process. We've covered an awful lot of information today. We focused on early in the conversation around predict, understanding the vulnerabilities, threats, and impacts. Communicable illness is something that's very real. We've seen outbreaks of chicken pox, measles, uh, meningitis in schools across our country. Uh, we had, uh, right in the end of last year, an outbreak of a, in California in a school where several dozen children developed polio-like symptoms. It was, in fact, not polio, but there was paralysis involved, and it looks like it's permanent. The cause of that is still yet unknown. The concept here is that communicable illness is an issue that you have to face. There are regular seasonal flus, there are childhood diseases that come through, and it will have impacts on your teachers and on your students. So it is something that we can predict. And bioradar, the organization has forecast the return of the swine flu at pandemic levels in the fall. You have the luxury of time now. Now is the time to focus on your plan, looking at your policies, your procedures and processes, perform. It's time to train your people. It's time to get the supplies in. And it's time to do a, a tabletop exercise and focus on dealing with those issues. We'd like to thank the Tennessee Association of Independent Schools for underwriting this webinar series uh, for you. 
and sharing this information. Uh, there's a lot to think about when we think about communicable illness and the impacts that it can have on our young people uh, as they uh, move through their life. But children's diseases, while it, we talk about it being child's play for children, is very serious for adults. The impacts on a adults are disproportional in that process. And as we stated at the beginning, it, the CDC and World Health Organization shows that young people up through the age of 24 are the most susceptible when we're talking about these types of global pandemics and coming through. So there's a lot to think about. There's even more to do. If you've got questions, you can go to firestorm.com. You'll find some information there as we have discussed today. You'll also be able to have, go and listen to a recording of this webinar or share it with others within your school. If you have questions, you can contact us at webinars at firestorm.com or you can call us at 800-321-2219. Thank you for what you do in our schools every day. You uh, and your team are making a difference in the lives of our young people. Communicable illness is a very real threat occurred. It's occurred within the last few years. It appears to be emerging now with the MERS threat that's hit us on U.S. soil. And uh, we have a very real projection of a return of the swine flu at pandemic levels in the fall. Certainly a topic that would in involve our parents as they think about are our students safe. Thank you for investing the time with us today and listening to this webinar. I look forward to meeting you in person at a crisis coach workshop in Tennessee in the fall. And again, feel free to call us at any time. Bill, thanks for coordinating everything today. And we look forward to talking with the schools uh, directly. And we're going to ask Gertie to try to follow up with as many people as possible that were in attendance today. So thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Goodbye. Thank you, Jim.